Hi, welcome back to another lecture. In this lecture, I am going to discuss the uh, traditional and the modern square of opposition. What are these square of opposition? First of all, opposition or the laws of opposition refer to uh, the traditional interpretation of categorical logic according to Aristotle. So according to uh, uh, categorical logic, there are four categorical forms, A, E, I, and O. And uh, according to the uh, traditional interpretation, these four categorical forms exist in a certain uh, relation with each other. And they obey these laws of opposition. There are only five laws. Contradiction, contrariety, subcontrariety, superalternation, and subalternation. Let me explain what they are. The first one is the law of contradiction. This simply says that A and O are contradictories and so are E and I. What does that mean? It means that if one is true, the other one must be false. They cannot both be true, they cannot both be false. For example, if I say all bananas are yellow, then it must be false that some bananas are not yellow. And if I say no bananas are yellow is true, then it must be false that some bananas are yellow is true. It must be false. And vice versa. If O is true, A is false. If O is false, A is true. Okay, so they, uh, these uh, categorical forms, A and O, E and I, have opposite truth values. The second relation is contrariety. This applies to uh, the universal statements A and E. So A and E are said to be contraries, which means that they cannot both be true, but they may both be false. Think about it. If it's true that all bananas are yellow, it cannot be true that no bananas are yellow. But if some bananas are yellow and some bananas are not yellow, then they're both false. It is false that all are, and it is false that none are. The third law of opposition is known as subcontrariety. And this applies to uh, the particular forms I and O. Remember that I says some S are P, and O says some S are not P. Now, these two are known as subcontraries. And they cannot both be false, but they may both be true. So subcontrariety, if, if you, let me go back, as you can see, is the mirror image of contrariety. Right? Contrariety is that they cannot both be true, but they may both be false. Subcontrariety says that they cannot both be false, but they may both be true. For example, as, as I said earlier, it is true that some bananas are yellow and some bananas are not yellow. Okay, so I and O may both be true. But if it's false that some bananas are yellow, it cannot be false that some bananas are not yellow because that's exactly what the denial of I entails. 
the fourth law is called superalternation. This law says that the falsity of a particular statement, which is known as the subaltern, I and or O, entails the falsity of its corresponding superaltern, A or E, but not the other way around. So, for example, suppose that it is false that some bananas are yellow. Well, if it's false that some bananas are yellow, guess what? It must be false that all bananas are yellow. But it's not the other way around. Because if it's false that all bananas are yellow, it might be true that some bananas are yellow. See, so falsity goes up. What, I, what, what, I'm, what that means is that, according to this law, it is possible to infer the falsity of a universal statement from the falsity of a particular statement. But it would be a wrong inference to do the other way around, to derive a falsity, a false particular from a false universal. Similarly, this applies to uh, E and O. Okay? If it's false that some bananas are not yellow, okay? I deny that some bananas are yellow then it must be false that no bananas are yellow. Because if I deny that some bananas are not yellow, I affirm that some bananas are yellow. And consequently, it would be false that no banana, no bananas are yellow. So once again, falsity is moved upward. Falsity goes up, but it doesn't go down. Not the other way around. Great. Now, the, the, uh, the, the fifth and final law of opposition is known as subalternation. Subalternation is a law that says that the truth of a universal uh, or a, a superaltern entails the truth of its corresponding subaltern, but not the other way around. Okay, if I say that it is true that all bananas are yellow, it must be the true that some bananas are yellow. Think about it this way. Sometimes students say, I don't understand what that means. Think about all bananas in the world. Suppose that all bananas in the world are contained in a very large box. Those are all the bananas in the world. And uh, suppose that it is true that all bananas in the world are yellow. Now, imagine that you are taking a sample. You're taking some bananas out of that box. Don't you see that it follows that by logical necessity, if all bananas are yellow, and if you take some bananas out of that box, those bananas that you have taken must be yellow as well, okay? So the truth of a uni the universal A entails the truth of the particular corresponding subaltern I, but not the other way around. Why? Because if you have a bunch of bananas, a few bananas, some bananas, not all bananas in the world, but just some, you go to the store, you buy some bananas, they are yellow. Can you infer from the fact that you are holding, say, five bananas and they're all yellow, can you then infer from this that all bananas in the world are, are yellow? Obviously not. So as you can see, truth goes down, but it doesn't go up. 
Similarly, this apply, applies to the E form and the O form. Now, when you put all this together, you have what is known as the traditional square of opposition. A, E, I, and O, and all the oppositions there. But I want you now to uh, pay attention and notice a feature of the traditional version, the traditional interpretation of the square of opposition. The feature to which I'm referring is the existential import, which is diagrammed by placing an X inside, right here, inside the category of the subject. So what does that mean? It means that by making a universal statement, the universal statement, for example, A, I don't just mean all SRP, all bananas are yellow. According to the traditional interpretation, I'm actually saying that there exist bananas in the world right now, and there, there are all of them. All of them are yellow. This is the kind of statement that I make according to the traditional square of opposition. Similarly, the O form, the, the E form, sorry, has that existential import because it says there exists bananas in the world and not even one of them is yellow. No SRP. Now, naturally, you might have noticed that the particular propositions, the particular affirmative I and particular negative O, must have the existential import, of course, because if you're making a, a particular statement, you are referring to some. Some are or some are not. So, uh, what's the problem? Let me explain what the problem is and why the modern square of opposition. So the traditional square of opposition enables us to make certain inferences from the four categorical forms according to the, the laws of opposition. So if one is true, if one statement is true, the other one must be false and vice versa and so on. But these inferences these inferences rely or depend on an existential import. Again, as I explained, take the example of an A form. The A form, suppose that the subject is Martians and the predicate is blonde. Then the A form states that all Martians are blonde and there exist Martians. Now this is a problem for uh, modern logicians because when we talk about Martians, when we talk about dinosaurs or triangles or at any rate any object, anything that is abstract or uh, doesn't exist in reality, we don't want to commit ourselves to uh, making an existential assumption. Consequently, we cannot use the traditional square of opposition when we uh, make inferences about, again, dinosaurs or triangles or things uh, that do not exist. But why should we make inferences or talk about these entities? Because, well, 
for one thing, when we talk about math, we are, we're, we're making statements about triangles or geometry uh, or numbers, and those statements make sense, although the entities uh, in question, triangles or numbers, don't really exist in a, in a physical sense. So, perhaps you, you uh, might think that the, uh, the simple solution is to use the square of opposition, the traditional square of opposition, only for those entities that exist. But when we talk about abstract entities, then we cannot use it. Well, unfortunately, there's a, there's a further problem. The problem is that if I, th there are certain statements, as I will show you in a second, that refer to entities that do exist, and yet it would be wrong to make an existential import. Let me give you this example. All shoplifters are prosecuted. Now you see that if I if I think that this statement, if I say that this statement is true, then the existential import would be an issue because the existential import in this case says that the category of shoplifters is not empty. There is at least one shoplifter. But that's not what I mean when I say all shoplifters are prosecuted. If it's true what I mean, I mean that the category of shoplifters is empty. Why? Because all of them are prosecuted. Consequently, I must remove that existential import. And, and again, I, I want to emphasize this. Now I'm not talking about abstract entities, but I'm talking about, I'm referring to shoplifters who uh, really exist. But if I want to diagram the statement, all shoplifters are prosecuted, then I have a problem if I have that X because then that statement would be false. Why? Once again, because, because the, the, the subject category contains at least one shoplifter. And, and therefore, the statement all shoplifters are prosecuted would be false because there is, a, there is one that is not prosecuted. So what's the solution? Well, according to modern logicians, the solution is let's drop the uh, existential import once and for all. But the price to pay is very high. Let me explain why. As you recall, the logical relation between uh, the A form and the E form is a relation of contrariety, which means that they cannot both be true, but they may both be false. Now, if I remove the existential import, I remove the X, if I no longer make an existential assumption, then guess what? Proposition A all shoplifters are prosecuted is true. But guess what? Proposition E is true as well because it is true that no shoplifters are prosecuted. Right? Because there aren't any. Consequently, because, because of this, removing the existential assumption makes both A and E true. But this is 
in opposition to uh, the relation of contrariety. Consequently, what happens? What happens is that A and E are no longer contraries. That relation of contrariety no longer holds without the existential assumption. So contrariety is gone. It's gone from the point of view of modern, the modern interpretation, the modern square of opposition. So that law of opposition no longer applies. Similarly, subcontrariety is also gone because remember that subcontrariety says that the subcontraries, I and O, cannot both be false. But if all shoplifters are prosecuted is true, then it would be false that some shoplifters are prosecuted and it would be false that some shoplifters are not prosecuted. Okay? And you can clearly see it because if it's false, I mean, sorry, if it's true that all shoplifters are prosecuted, according to the the, uh, modern interpretation, remember the modern interpretation no longer has the X inside the diagram. And so uh, the, the, the truth, okay, the truth of the uh, universal cannot be the same, cannot be, um, um, cannot infer, cannot entail, sorry, the truth of the particular. Why? Because the, the universal doesn't have an existential import. So, consequently, you cannot say that the particular, which has the X, the existential import, is also true. So, subcontrariety is gone. Why? Because I and O can both be false. But the rule, according to the traditional one, traditional square, is that they cannot both be false. Now, there's another problem here. Superalternation is also gone. Why? Because superalternation says that the falsity of a particular, if you recall, the falsity of a particular entails the falsity of a universal. But think about it. If it's false that some shoplifters are prosecuted, okay, I mean, let me put it this way. If it's true that all shoplifters are prosecuted, then the particular statement I would be false. Some some shoplifters are prosecuted. Okay? But then the universal A is true because it's true that all shoplifters are prosecuted. Okay? So, the universal can be true while the, uh, the particular is false, but this is contrary to uh, superalternation, which says if the, um, the particular is false, then the universal must be false. Now, once again, let me explain it again. I hope this is clear. <clears throat> If you say that all shoplifters are prosecuted, suppose that all shoplifters are prosecuted, then I would be false. Why would it be false? Because because of that X. There's an X that says there are some shoplifters and some of them are prosecuted. No, this is false. All of them are prosecuted. But then if all of them are prosecuted, then A can be true and I can be false. This also applies to O and E. The falsity of O no longer 
entail entails the falsity of E. So O can be false. It can be false that some shoplifters are not prosecuted. But it can be true that no shoplifters are prosecuted because there aren't any if all shoplifters are prosecuted. Okay. So super alternation gone. No longer there. So what's left? Well, subalternation is left. Remember that subalternation says the truth of a universal statement entails the truth of its corresponding particular statement. So if it's true that all shoplifters are, are prosecuted, then it would have to be true that some shoplifters are prosecuted. But remember, according to the uh, modern interpretation, as you can see now, there's no, uh, no existential import is made by the modern interpretation. And this makes the A form, all shoplifters are prosecuted, a true proposition. But if this is true, then its corresponding particular statement, some shoplifter, shoplifters are prosecuted, must be false. You get it? Why must it be false? It must be false because it is false that there, there exists some shoplifters. If all shoplifters are prosecuted, there aren't any shoplifters. But then it's false that there are some. Okay, so once again, this is contrary to subalternation because subalternation says if the universal is true, the particular must be true. But as I just demonstrated, according to the uh, modern interpretation, which no longer makes an existential assumption, the universal is true and the particular is false. Therefore, gone. Subalternation is gone. Now, what's left now? Well, you might be sad to learn that the only law of opposition that remains untouched is the contradiction. So uh, A and O are still contradictories and E and I are still contradictories. And that is it. You cannot make any other inferences according to the modern square of opposition. I hope this was clear and it was helpful to you. This is, this is all. Thank you for listening. I'll see you in the next video.